Playmé under siege. At 7.15pm on October 19th, 1965, the distant crackle of small arms fire began to drift over the south wall of the Playmé CIDG camp. The lead elements of the 2nd Battalion, 33rd NVA Regiment, had run into one of the camp's eight-man pickets. Then three hours later, gunfire lit up the top of the Chuho Hill as a 40-man NVA assault force overwhelmed the Mountain Yard outpost. Mortar rounds began exploding around the camp at 11pm, recoilless rifle rounds tearing into the camp's defences, the heaviest fire coming from the southwest. The defenders responded with 81mm and 4.2-inch mortar fire. Special Forces troopers rushed to join the Mountain Yards, waiting in their rifle pits and bunkers, while Captain Harold M. Moore, commander of Special Forces Detachment A217, called for flare and gunship support. In the darkness, less than 300 metres from the perimeter wire, the NVA assault troops crouched in their positions, weapons grasped tight in their hands. Playmate CIDG Camp the Playmé CIDG camp was one of 14 camps strung out along the Tukor boundary from Con Noon to Dak Lap. It was located on Provincial Route 5, a single lane dirt track which joined Highway 14 at two points. The camp stood at an elevation of 320 metres, higher ground to the northeast and south, its three walls forming an equilateral triangle, each side 160 metres long. Two rows of concertina wire defined the outer perimeter, and an inner, smaller triangle, half the size of the first, was surrounded by more wire. A bulldozed no man's land between them was seeded with stake tanglefoot, claymore mines, and trip flares. The camp's outer line of active defense was marked by a four feet deep gun trench, rifle positions spaced along it, the positions supplemented by sandbagged bunkers that housed M1919.30 caliber machine guns. Interconnecting communications trenches crossed the camp. A reinforced blockhouse, equipped with an M2.50 caliber machine gun, stood at each corner of the triangle. The blockhouses provided interlocking fields of fire, which made them priority targets for the communists. The defences also included two 81mm medium and four 4.2 inch heavy mortars. 400 local Zurai tribesmen, armed with outdated American weapons, comprised its CIDG strike force garrison. Also stationed at the camp were 14 Vietnamese Special Forces soldiers, but while Captain Chan Van Yan was in nominal control of the camp, the purpose of the LLDB was to monitor the mountain yards. Moore, who had taken over A217 two weeks earlier, was instead in command of the Playmate camp. Five CIDG ambush patrols and two outposts were maintained outside the perimeter. One outpost was near an old French fort, a kilometre northeast of the camp, while the second was on Chuho Hill, 2,000 metres to the south. On October 17th, Moore ordered his executive officer, First Lieutenant Robert H. Berry, and Sergeant First Class Jimmy Beach to take a company of mountain yards to investigate reports of Viet Cong activity. Operation at Chung Zung 40 would take the company 15 kilometres northwest of camp before turning east toward Highway 14, then south back to Play May. The Central Highlands The Central Highlands was a sparsely populated area covering 67,000 square kilometres. It was defined by the Anamite chain of mountains, which formed a crescent shaped plateau, 400 kilometres long and 160 wide. Dominating the area southwest of Play Kill is the Chupong Massif, rising to over 700 feet and extending 13 kilometres east to west and north to south. The Yardrang River flows generally northwest along its northern edge. Dense tropical forests covered the slopes of the steep mountains, jagged crests falling away to narrow valleys. Thick forests covered much of the plateau, in places thinning to elephant grass that rose to shoulder height. Highway 19 ran from the coast through Play Coup to the Cambodian border, while Highway 14 ran north to south, connecting Con Noon, Play Coup, and Ban Mae Tuo. The Thai Nguyen Campaign At his headquarters between the Cambodian border and Play May, B3 Front Commander General Chu Hui Man conceived a bold plan for the autumn of 1965. His plan called for the destruction of the camps at Play May, Lak Sut, and Luk Xiao the destruction of the Leitang district headquarters and the capture of Pleiku City. 
The Thai New Yen campaign would also mark the start of multi-regiment operations in the south. The 33rd Regiment was ordered to encircle the Playmate camp, while the 320th Regiment was to prepare a position to ambush the expected relief force. The 33rd would then exert just enough pressure to force the dispatch of the relief, and after the column had been ambushed and destroyed by the 320th, the two regiments would then combine to overrun the camp. The 33rd Regiment, under Lieutenant Colonel Vu Sa, was untested moving south from Quang Ninh province in North Vietnam and arriving in the south in October 1965. Its lead elements arriving in Western Play Coup on September 10th. On October 2nd, the complete regiment moved into a staging area at the eastern foot of the Chu Pong Massif in the Yardrang Valley. The 320th Regiment, led by Lieutenant Colonel Xin Khan, with a strength of approximately 2,000 men, had completed its movement down the Ho Chi Minh Trail from Nha Nam in North Vietnam to northwest Con Nun province by late January 1965. The regiment operated in Con Nun and Play Coup provinces, conducting operations at Po Le Cleng in March, Le Tang in June and Luc Xiao in August. After receiving a beating at Luc Xiao, the regiment spent weeks being resupplied and reinforced with replacements from the north. The 320th began its preparations as early as September 19th. Regimental reconnaissance teams surveyed the ambush site and a sand table replica was constructed. Units were also tasked with exercises to increase their readiness. The regiments had departed for the ambush site, a 4km stretch of Route 5, 30km south of Play Coup and 10km north of Play May by October 10th. Regimental work crews constructed camouflaged fortifications at the pre-ambush assembly area, positioned some distance from the road, and cleared and camouflaged paths to the actual ambush positions. The ambush positions, as close as 25 metres from the road, had to be dug and equipped with overhead cover to protect from American airstrikes, and the regimental transportation unit, the 17th Company, pre-staged ammunition, food and medical supplies. The 635th Battalion was positioned on two hills overlooking Route 5 and was to attack the head of the column and canalise it in the valley between the two points, while the 334th was ordered to conduct attacks from three small hills near the road and break the column into smaller pockets. It would then move around to the rear, cut off retreat and block any reinforcing Arvon units. The 966th would be held in reserve 2000 metres to the west and was also responsible for dealing with any air assault elements attempting to relieve the column. The 320th was in position and ready to spring the ambush by October 19th. The First Assault The A217 troopers were scattered along the trench line every 10 to 15 metres where they could support the three-man CIDG fire teams, and Staff Sergeant Robert T. Sloan operated the 4.2-inch mortar at the centre of the camp with a team of mountain yards. The first assaults on the outer wire began at 12.30am from the north and northwest. Soon most of the perimeter was under pressure. Sappers charged the wire with satchel charges and Bangalore torpedoes, infantry in khaki uniforms and piff helmets and firing assault rifles surging behind them. Many of the sappers were cut down before they reached the wire, but some made it through the withering defensive fire, sliding Bangalore torpedoes under the wire to blast gaps with devastating explosions. The NVA concentrated their main effort to the northwest, B-40 rockets and rounds from 57mm recoilless rifles demolishing the heavy machine gun bunker, while human waves surged against the perimeter. By 1.10am, the communists were inside the wire to the south, near the main gate, and near the northwest heavy machine gun bunker, but the defenders held their ground. Sustaining dreadful losses, the NVA assault waves broke and then rolled back, leaving bodies piled up in the concertina wire and minefields. The communists had been stopped, but the medical dispensary, communications bunker and ammunition storehouse had been blasted, and dozens of mountain yards had been killed inside the camp on Chuho Hill and in the pickets. Direct medical dispensary would now instead be used as a makeshift morgue for the mountain yard dead, and when there was no more room inside, bodies would be laid out on the bare ground outside. First in body bags, and when those were exhausted, the bodies were wrapped in army blankets and then the bright blue, yellow and red parachute silk used in supply drops. 
at 6am, direct hits from 57mm recoilless rifles destroyed the bunker at the northeast corner of the camp, the second of the three corner bunkers to be shattered. And two hours later, the defenders drove sappers back from the main gate with small arms and machine gun fire. Daylight brought the first medevac helicopter into the compound from the 498th Air Ambulance Company at Camp Holloway. Close Air Support Two UH-1B Hueys from 3rd Platoon, 119th Aviation Company had arrived on station at 0.50am. The Hueys were armed with four 2.75-inch rocket pods, 12 rockets to each pod, twin flex-mounted 7.62mm machine guns, a nose-mounted 40mm grenade launcher, and the door gunners were equipped with M60 machine guns. Captain Robert K. Wright began an orbit to the northeast, sprinkling flares over the camp. The worst of the incoming fire seemed to be coming from near the dirt airstrip to the south of the camp, and banking hard toward the muzzle flashes, he poured 2.75 inch rockets and 40mm grenades into the NVA positions. The first flare ship, a C-123 from the 309th Air Commando Squadron, piloted by Major Howard Pearson, was overhead at 3.40am, and making low passes due to the low cloud cover, he flooded the camp with the flickering white light of magnesium flares. Pearson had stopped at New Blakeu Air Base to pick up Captain Dick Shortridge, a senior FAC with the 21st Tactical Air Support Squadron. Shortridge directed the first A1E Sky Raiders to drop their ordnance on the attacking NVA. However, the NVA assault troops were so close to the wire that they escaped much of the effects of the bombs and napalm. An AC-47 Spooky turned lazy circles over the camp, dropping flares and raining never-ending streams of red tracer from its M134 miniguns. F-100s and 105s also streaked overhead, cluster munitions and napalm tumbling from their wings, and twin-engine B-57 Canberras added to the carnage with their 500 and 750 pound bombs. Shortridge was back on station at daylight in an O-1 bird dog, using the four 2.75 inch rocket pods under each wing and a dozen white phosphorus grenades to mark targets for the Air Force. C-123s from the Air Force 310th Air Commando Squadron and Caribous from the Army 92nd Aviation Company dropped more than 333,000 pounds of ammunition, food, water and first aid supplies during the siege, with only 9,000 pounds landing outside the wire. Special Forces riggers prepared the pallets to be heavier than normal loads. The G-13 parachutes would then slow the loads as little as possible. Dropped at 300 feet, the parachutes rarely had time to deploy fully, and dropping like boulders, they would sometimes smash structures as well as men. The Burning Huey Troopers popped an M18 smoke grenade inside the camp, its yellow smoke curling up from a makeshift landing zone between two buildings. Major Lewis Mitzel heaved his Huey Medivac into a violent flare, his escorting gunships a little above and behind him, saturating the surrounding hills with rockets. Then Mitzel was dangerously high above the landing zone as he slowed his Huey from a hundred knots, right thundering past to the southwest, desperate to draw fire from the vulnerable Medivac, Warrant Officer Ron Macklin close behind. Both poured fire into the NVA positions, then banked sharply left, heading for the relative safety to the east. Small arms fire peppered Wright's Huey, but great 20mm rounds tore into Macklin's gunship, and as Wright turned to look back, with horror he saw that his wingman's Huey was shredded and burning. Trailing flame and smoke, it careened into the ground, exploding near the runway. Wright swooped down, unleashing a torrent of rockets and machine gun fire into the hordes of NVA, boiling towards the burning Huey, until, ammunition spent, he turned away to the northeast. Rigged for three litters, Mitzel took more wounded on board, then heaved his Huey over the compound buildings, and, pushing the nose down to gain a hundred knots, he clawed desperately to clear the tree line at the camp's perimeter. Moore led Sergeant First Class Joseph Bailey and Specialist 4 Dan Shea, a team medic, and 10 mountain yards through the perimeter wire. Finally reaching the edge of the airstrip, they advanced in line, slowly approaching the burning hulk. The tree line suddenly exploded with enemy fire, and Bailey was hit immediately. She had crawled toward him to render aid, but before he could reach Bailey, he was hit a second time. Moore ordered Shea to get Bailey back to the compound, 
and with troopers at the perimeter pouring on covering fire. Two Montagnards went to help carry Bailey, but before they could lift him, he was hit a third time, and moments later Shea was also wounded. While Shea dragged Bailey back, Moore worked to cover the retreat, firing at muzzle flashes, until they reached the perimeter wire, where they were pulled back inside the camp. The patrol returns. Earlier, and 25 kilometers to the northeast, First Lieutenant Robert H. Berry had been standing near the junction of Highway 14 and Provincial Route 5. Using the road as reference, a stream of helicopters thundered towards the southwest and Play May. Berry turned the patrol back down Route 5, the heavy thumps of exploding ordnance growing more distinct as they continued. The road rose toward an abandoned French fort, 500 meters north of the camp. 100 meters from it, Berry heard the tack 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 of rifle fire to the front of the column. The mountain yards had run into a poorly executed ambush, and suffering no casualties, at 9.30pm, Berry led the patrol through the main gate. Delta reinforces the camp. Urgent requests for assistance, made by Moore and LLDB commander Captain Chan Van Yan, had been received at two core tactical zone headquarters in Pleiku by 5.18am on October 20th. The only Arvent unit available, however, was reserved for the defence of Pleiku. At 5th Group Headquarters in Nha Chan, Colonel William A. Bulldog McKean, Head of US Special Forces in Vietnam, and his South Vietnamese counterpart, Major General Zhuan Van Quang, were working on options to help Player May. It was decided that Project Delta, under Major Charles A. Beckwith, would reinforce the camp. Delta, with two companies of the Arvon 91st Airborne Ranger Battalion, was running a reconnaissance operation near Phu Cat, in support of Operation Tunfang 6 in northern Binzing province. Beckwith received the warning order at 1.30pm on the 20th, and two hours later he had assembled 14 hand-picked Delta troopers and the two companies of the 91st on the tarmac at the Ki Nyan airfield. By 5pm they had landed at New Pleiku airbase, too late for movement to Play May, delaying the operation to the 21st. Company A, 1st Aviation Battalion, based at Ban Mae Tuo, were selected to transport Delta and the Rangers. H-34s from Marine Corps 363rd Medium Helicopter Squadron at Kinyon were also made available. Beckwith and McKean were airborne by 6.30am on the 21st, looking for a landing zone. A clearing 5 kilometers northeast of the camp was eventually selected. An hour later, aircraft and helicopter gunships began preparing the landing zone. Approaching the landing zone in waves, door gunners spraying the trees with their M60s, the troopers leapt from the Hueys and the H-34s and raced to the tree line. Encountering no resistance, the transports completed the first lift and returned for the second. The lifts were complete by 10.30am and half an hour later the relief column moved out. But hacking through dense elephant grass, razor sharp blades growing as high as 12 feet, the men were already exhausted by noon. The column then came upon an empty village, thin wisps of smoke rising from numerous cook fires. Radio contact was established with the camp at 8pm and early the next morning, Delta and the Rangers raced across 300 yards of open ground toward the main gate, sprinting through relatively ineffective small arms fire which killed one South Vietnamese officer, lightly wounding five other Rangers. Once inside, Beckwith took command of the camp and began reorganising its defences. Clearing the enemy out McKean had ordered Beckwith to clear the enemy out. Play May had received continuous fire from the high ground 400 metres to the north, and Beckwith organised a free company assault force to clear it. The assault force, one CIDG company, led by a detachment A217 NCO and two ranger companies, would advance up the hill, conduct a body count, gather intelligence and weapons, then return to the camp. The three companies moved out between 1 and 2pm on October 22nd, the two ranger companies advancing abreast in a skirmish line, the CIDG company to their rear. After working their way along the ridge and encountering no resistance, they prepared to turn back to the camp, Captain Thomas Puss's ranger company to the right, First Lieutenant Ewell White to the left. While White's rangers were searching the body of a Chinese officer, heavy fire tore into their flank and rear. Concealed along the ridge line was a battalion of the NVA 33rd Regiment, and the communists had waited for the trailing CIDG to enter their killing zone before opening fire. White and the Ranger commander turned their men into position, 
but rather than order the rangers to lay down suppressive fire and use manoeuvre to overcome the positions, the ranger commander, swagger stick in hand, instead ordered a frontal assault. The rangers then rose and charged headlong toward the NVA, but immediately rounds began sawing through their ranks, dead and wounded falling all around. An Air Force observer contacted White. He had napalm for him and wanted to know if the rangers were at a safe distance. But when the company commander ordered a retreat, the rangers instead turned and ran. Almost immediately, White was hit in the back with a 7.62mm round. And crumpling to the ground, White keyed his radio as he scrambled for cover. Moments later, a flight of F-105s thundered overhead, napalm canisters tumbling from their wings and exploding across the NVA positions. But the machine gun emplacements were connected to deep tunnels, and after taking cover in them, the NVA quickly returned to their positions. Some time had passed when Sergeant First Class Marion Mike Holloway joined White. Holloway pulled him into a small foxhole, and prone beside White, he called in a smoke screen from the camp. Then, under the cover of the blossoming smoke, the two staggered, low crawled, and finally ran back into the camp. Eleven of the Rangers and CIDG had been killed, and 26 were wounded. Pusser was among those killed. By 9am on the 23rd, Beckwith had ordered a second attempt to clear the NVA from the high ground. One CIDG and one Ranger platoon would assault the position with supporting fires from the camp. Berry would lead the CIDG platoon, while an LLDB lieutenant would lead the Rangers. Sergeant Major Bill DeSoto would also join the assault force. Moving out under covering machine gun fire, the assault force laid down a base of fire while manoeuvring into position. Suddenly, the LLDB lieutenant fell to Berry's left, around penetrating his steel helmet, killing him instantly. An NVA soldier then leapt from a fighting hole and charged, screaming toward the assault force, a grenade in his hand. At that moment, the two platoons were consumed with heavy small arms and machine gun fire from nearby positions, and DeSoto was hit in the shoulder with a .51 caliber round, which almost tore off his arm. This threw the assault force into a panic, but supporting fire from the camp quickly shot the NVA soldier dead and under its protective fire, Berry rallied the men, the assault force withdrawing in good order back inside the wire. Planning the relief With only one armoured cavalry squadron and two ranger battalions in reserve, 2 Corps commander General Vin Locke was reluctant to strip play coup of its defences. But, encouraged by his American advisers, on the afternoon of the 20th, he released most of his reserve as an armoured task force. The 24th Special Tactical Zone Headquarters was tasked with organising the relief, and that afternoon, Brigadier General Cao Hao Hun and his staff flew to play coup, establishing a forward command post to coordinate the relief effort. The ATF was based around the 3rd Armoured Cavalry Squadron, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Nguyen Luat, essentially the same force used for the relief of Luxiao in August. It consisted of a company of 16 M41 tanks under Captain Nguyen Mang Lam, an M113 armoured personnel carrier company commanded by Captain Du Nok Tang, two towed 105mm howitzers from the 222nd Artillery, a platoon from the 201st Engineers, Luat's squadron headquarters, and the squadron supply trains. Infantry support would be provided by the 400-man 21st Ranger Battalion under Captain Nguyen Van Sack. Only the 22nd Ranger Battalion remained to defend Play Coup, but Hun and his senior advisor, Lieutenant Colonel Archie D. Heil, were concerned that would not be enough, risking the destruction of the camp and the relief force. The Americans believed they would have to ring more men out of Vinlock, and Hun agreed, but for now Luat and the ATF would have to be kept on a short leash. Luat was ordered to move down Highway 14 toward the junction with Provincial Route 5 at Pu Mi, 19 km south of Play Coup. Route 5 then turned southwest toward Play May and was the road a reaction force would have to take to reach the camp. Luat, however, was instructed to go no further than Pumi and instead engage only in aggressive patrolling. The ATF then departed at 4.30pm on the 20th, reaching Pumi three hours later, where Luat bivouacked for the night. It was now estimated that the communists had committed at least two regiment-sized units, with an estimated strength of 4,000 troops. Vin Lok, however, continued to be concerned that the attack on Play May was designed to draw forces from Play Coup and leave it undefended, 
while his American advisor, Colonel Metaxas, wanted to reinforce the relief to counter the expected ambush. The air cav arrives. The stalemate was broken on October 22nd when Major General Stanley R. Larson, Commander Field Force Vietnam, a core level command based at Nachan, flew to Pleiku and promised Finlock that US troops would protect Pleiku if he released his two reserve battalions. Lawson then ordered Major General Harry W. O. Kinnard, commanding 1st Cavalry Division at Anke, to send a battalion task force to Camp Holloway to secure Pleiku and the two corps headquarters. Kinnard also began to extract 1st Brigade from its operations near Bin K, east of Anke, across the Xiao Mang Pass believing it made sense to have the brigade as a controlling headquarters in a readiness position in Pleiku City. 1st Brigade was at that time commanded by its deputy commander, Lieutenant Colonel Harlow Clark, as Colonel L.V. Roberts had been evacuated for medical treatment. Kinnard also ordered Brigadier General Richard T. Knowles to establish a tactical operations centre at Pleiku to assume overall command of American forces. He would then be given permission to move the entire 1st Brigade to Pleiku, the brigade would provide artillery support to the ATF and it would prepare a reaction force that could be committed to the camp. Knoll's instructions were very restrictive. The relief of Play May was an Arvon operation and Knoll's could only assist if called upon to do so and only after receiving permission from Kinnard and Larson. Knoll's complained to Kinnard who then convinced Larson to amend the instructions to provide more flexibility. He was now instructed to assist the Arvon if called upon to do so, and to seek permission if time and communications permit. Task Force Ingram was the first element into Camp Holloway on Friday the 22nd. The task force was composed of 2nd Battalion, 12th Cavalry, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Earl Ingram, a battery of the 2nd Battalion, 17th Artillery, an aerial gun section from the 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry, two lift platoons from the 229th Assault Helicopter Battalion, and assorted supporting forces. Kinnard finally received permission at that time from Larson to send 1st Brigade to play a coup. 1st Brigade, its headquarters element, 2nd Battalion, 8th Cavalry, and two batteries of the 2nd Battalion, 19th Artillery, were extracted from Bin K by 3pm on Friday, and had arrived at Camp Holloway by midnight, 1st Brigade assuming operational control of Task Force Ingram. 24th Special Tactical Zone planners had three options. The ATF could follow Route 5 from Pumi to Plate May, a route to the east of Route 5, or it could go cross-country. The route to the east was quickly ruled out, as the five bridges required to traverse it had been dropped by local force Viet Cong. And while the cross-country route would reduce the risk of ambush, it would take at least four days to cover the broken ground. Route 5 was therefore the only practical approach. The 22nd Ranger Battalion, under the command of Captain Pham Van Phuc, now released, would be airlifted into the rear of the expected ambush. The rangers would then push east toward Route 5, destroy any enemy forces it encountered and establish a blocking position. Vin Lok had also consented to Hun adding the 1st Battalion, 42nd Infantry Regiment from the 24th Special Tactical Zone at Con Noon. The regiment was to join the ATF at Pu Mi. The strength of the relief force had been raised to almost 1,200 troops. ATF enters the kill zone. 142 was airlifted from Con Noon to New Pleiku Air Base at 10 a.m. on the 21st and was struck down to Pu Mi to join the ATF one hour later. At the head of the ATF column in his command M113 APC, Luat turned his now reinforced task force southwest on Route 5 toward Play May at 2 p.m. Tanks and APCs led, dismounted infantry from 142 on the left two companies of the 21st Rangers to the right. A mile to the rear, the two other Ranger companies, with three M8 Greyhound light armoured cars, provided security for two 105mm howitzers and the transport vehicles that carried the ATF's food, fuel and ammunition. Thick vegetation encroached within a few feet of the road, and progress was slow as the vehicles on point could move no faster than the infantry. The column stretched out to almost two miles as it snaked along the narrow track. At 5pm, as the convoy approached the expected ambush site, Luat ordered a halt. After pre-planned airstrikes pounded the suspected NVA positions, he then gave the order to continue. The supply train, however, 2,000 metres to the rear, 
believed the temporary halt instead indicated that the day's march had ended, and some even began to cook their evening meals. But unknown to Luat and the troops in the supply train, the column was already inside the NVA's 4km long kill zone. 22nd Rangers Air Assault As the ATF began to move down Route 5 on the 23rd, the 420 men of the 22nd Rangers under Captain Pham Van Phuc were waiting to be lifted to a position west of Route 5, 9km north of Play May. The landing zone was situated on a low hill 2,000 metres from the road, and 1km north of the shallow mountain pass where 24th planners expected the ambush. The battalion was to drive east from the LZ to the Pumi Play May Road, then turn south toward the pass. The rangers would then act as a blocking force, trapping the NVA between it and the ATF. The sun sinking on the horizon, the helicopters of the 52nd were approaching what looked like an old cornfield, gunships raking the landing zone with rockets and machine gun fire. The landing zone was 2,000 metres from the ambush positions prepared by the 635th Battalion, but as the rangers appeared unlikely to move from the LZ, Khan decided to ignore them for the moment. The crackle of small arms fire rose in the distance, quickly rising in intensity as machine gun and recoilless rifle fire merged with the explosions of 82mm mortar rounds and B-40 rockets. The relief column was being ambushed here and not at the mountain pass to the south. Some of the rangers began to dig fighting holes, while others took up firing positions. Ambush the 320th Regiment was waiting for the relief force 10 km north of Play May and 30 km south of Play Coup. Ambush positions had been prepared and the units were now resting in concealed readiness positions. The ambush site was a 4 km stretch of Provincial Route 5. The hard packed dirt road ran generally south along a broad ridge line, broken by small stream beds, with dense forest on either side of the road. Underbrush and hardwoods grew to within a few feet of it providing superb concealment to the ambushing force. A sharp S-curve followed a 7km straight stretch of road, allowing the ambushers to place fields of fire directly down the column. The 635th Battalion was positioned on two small hills south of the first curve in the road. Its attached 75mm recoilless rifle company given the mission of destroying Arvin tanks. The 344th Battalion was placed 2,000 metres west of the road on three small hills that provided good fields of fire. The NVA planned to drive the Arvon column into the rugged terrain east of the road, in which they would divide the Arvon into small packets, which could then be picked apart at leisure. The 3rd Battalion, the 966th, was placed in reserve, 2,000 metres to the west of the ambush area. It was to be prepared to support either of the two engaged battalions, or to attack any Arvon forces air-landed to support the column. Reflecting its mission, the regimental order attached the anti-aircraft gun company, armed with 12.7mm machine guns, to the battalion. At 5.50pm on the 23rd, the main body of the ATF was 30km southwest of Play Coup and 10km outside Play May. A 5km gap had opened up between it and the now stationary supply train, and with the head of the column bunched up in the S-turns, Mortar rounds suddenly exploded along its length, machine gun and recoilless rifle fire and B-40 rockets erupting from the southeast and west. Dug in on two small hills south of the curves, the 635th Battalion had clear sight lines down the length of the column, and its attached 75mm recoilless rifle company tore into it, infantry charging forward to press the attack. But as the road was at a higher elevation, the communists were attacking uphill through the brush, and to add to their difficulties, Luat and his men had been expecting the ambush. The 16 M41 Bulldogs and 15 M113 APCs in the lead responded quickly, wheeling left and right, the tanks blasting the attackers with canister from their 76mm cannons and .50 caliber machine guns, the APCs rolling into fighting positions alongside them, also delivering a heavy volume of machine gun fire, while supporting infantry opened up with their weapons. As night approached, Huey gunships and F-100 Super Sabres appeared overhead, the F-100s delivering rockets, napalm and cannon fire, while the Army gunships placed rockets and machine gun fire on the NVA mortar and recoilless rifle positions. Lieutenant Brady Anderson, a MACV armour advisor in the lead tank, was instrumental in controlling the airstrikes. Under this devastating pounding, the firefight began to slacken, and the Communists were forced to break off the attack after two hours pulling back to secondary positions from where they continued to deliver harassing fire. 
5 km to the rear, however, the supply train was taking a beating. The 334th Battalion was responsible for this section of the kill zone, and its ambush combined with the 635th to the south. The Communists poured fire into the supply train from the east and from positions along three small hills to the west. The supply train lacked armour, and instead had only three lightly armoured M8 Greyhounds to escort it. Many of the Rangers were also riding on the vehicles, rather than maintaining tactical deployment on both sides of the road, and they took heavy casualties in the opening moments, as fire from the NVA raked the column. The soft-skinned vehicles, many laden with fuel and ammunition, were torn apart by recoilless rifle fire and B-40 rockets, secondary explosions sending white-orange fireballs and oily black smoke into the sky. With the supply train pinned down, a two or three company assault force charged forward from the south, briefly capturing the two howitzers. Captain Paul Leckinger, MACV advisor to the 21st Rangers, had become concerned about the supply train and had just arrived at its location when the ambush began. Realising that the train was about to be overrun under the murderous fire, Leckinger rallied the Rangers and helped organise a defensive perimeter. Overhead, forward air controller Captain Hank Lang had arrived in his O-1 bird dog and he began to call in airstrikes on the ambush positions. With Leckinger's radio disabled, leaving him unable to direct airstrikes, and with only desultory defensive fire replying to the much heavier NVA fire pouring into the perimeter, Lang had to improvise. Winding his way over a hailstorm of anti-aircraft fire, he flickered his landing lights, using them as makeshift flares to mark targets for the lurking F-100s. Over the next hour, Lang rained rockets and napalm on the communist positions, keeping the fighter bombers and gunships clear of the beleaguered perimeter. Under this relentless pounding, the NVA was forced to break off its attack, and Leckinger organised the perimeter to wait out the night. With the NVA fire subsiding, Luat pulled the main body back 1,000 metres and coiled his forces into a tight defensive position. The fight had cost the Arvon dearly, 50 men had been killed, 102 were wounded, and 19 were missing in action, the supply train sustaining most of the losses. Two Greyhounds had been destroyed, with another severely damaged. Two 105mm truck tractors and two gas tankers were also destroyed by recoilless rifle fire. Several other transport vehicles had also sustained heavy damage, and the two howitzers were damaged. Luat's armour had incurred no losses, with only minor damage to a few vehicles. NVA losses were estimated at 51 dead by body count, with one man captured. But Khan was determined to break the ATF. That night he ordered his reserve, the 966th Battalion, to attack the column from the north. After an approach march, the battalion was to divide into three company elements, moving into position either side of the ATF's main body. The companies began their assault at 3.15am on the 24th, but, as before, the communists were met by a deluge of heavy ground fire and airstrikes. The tanks fired canister, while fighter bombers doused the 966 with napalm, fragmentation and cluster munitions, 2.75 inch rockets and 20mm cannon fire. An AC-47 gunship also circled the area, dropping illumination flares and unleashing devastating 7.62mm minigun fire. The ATF again took few casualties, and with the communists suffering heavy losses, Can, with the agreement of Field Front, was forced to accept defeat. Leaving a small rearguard element behind, he ordered a general withdrawal west, toward the base area in the Chupong Massif complex near the Cambodian border. The major elements of the 320th Regiment had withdrawn from the area towards a staging area 8 miles southwest of Plume by daybreak. One of its battalions had lost half its strength, while the other two had also suffered badly. NVA withdraws. Monitoring the situation from a nearby temporary command post, General Chu Hui Man recognised that his objectives were now out of reach. He had neither devastated a South Vietnamese regiment or brought American forces to battle as he had intended. Therefore, he decided to withdraw the two regiments to the Yardrang Valley in Western Pleiku province, near the Cambodian border, where they would rest, reorganise and receive replacements. Having lost most of his ammunition and fuel, Luat decided to wait for resupply from Pleiku. Although the NVA had broken contact, Play May was still under pressure and the Arvon believed there were two NVA regiments between the ATF and the camp. The 22nd Ranger Battalion, which had orders to sweep east, had remained on its landing zone, only mortaring NVA elements when they came within range. 
By late morning on the 24th, the battalion moved down the hill, and by early afternoon, it had hacked its way through to the road and joined the column. Luat again formed a defensive perimeter and decided to send part of the ATF, including elements of the 21st Rangers, back to play coup for ammunition and fuel. He also called in medivacs for his most seriously wounded. With the resupply column moving back to play coup, senior American advisers worked to persuade Luat to continue toward play May. However, Luat refused to move without adequate artillery support. This was the request for help that the 1st Cavalry Division had been waiting for. ACAV supports the ATF. With Luat now asking for help, Kinnard convinced Larson to give the Brigade Task Force Commander the authority he required. Knowles then ordered Acting 1st Brigade Commander Clark to position his artillery to support the ATF. By 8.30am, Company B to 12th Cavalry had air assaulted into an open field 9km north of the ATF perimeter. With objective field goal secured without opposition, the rest of the 2nd Battalion and B Battery 217 artillery followed. From field goal, the 105mm howitzers could deliver supporting fire several kilometres down Route 5. To direct the artillery, Knowles assigned an artillery liaison officer with Luat and the ATF, and Captain John B. Avira, 1st Battalion, 77th Artillery, went in with a medivac on the afternoon of the 24th. Meanwhile at Plain May, alerted that the ATF would not reach them on the 24th, Major Thompson, Beckwith's executive officer, spent the afternoon coordinating airstrikes on NVA positions around the camp. Clark was also aware that Luat would not move on the 24th, and to provide better support to the relief column, he decided to move his artillery closer to the ATF. At 4pm, the 212 Cavalry moved by road to Field Goal South, 3 kilometres north of the ATF perimeter, while A and C Company's 2nd Battalion, 8th Regiment, under Lieutenant Colonel James H. Nix, seized LZ South, halfway between Plain May and the ATF, in an air mobile assault. Encountering no resistance, the position was secured for B Battery 219 Artillery. With the two batteries in position to support the ATF, senior advisers were confident Luat would start moving early on the 25th, but the column didn't begin to move until 1pm, when Avira got into the lead tank and began walking artillery fire down the road ahead of the advance, great geysers of smoke and fire exploding before the vehicles. The column met small arms fire at 3pm, 5km south of the ambush site, but artillery fire and airstrikes quickly suppressed the ambushes, who were either a stay-behind force from the NVA 320th Regiment or local force Viet Cong from villages west of the road. For good measure, Luat ordered a troop of M113s forward to blast the position with .50 calibre machine gun fire, while infantry used M79 grenade launchers to lob 40mm grenades into the bush. Having taken no casualties, the ATF continued, reaching play in May around dusk, where they established a perimeter to the north of the camp. The relief column had taken six days to travel the 30 miles between Play Coup and Play May. Meanwhile, also during the 25th, 1st Brigade had airlifted 28 and 219 from LZ South to position Homecoming, east of the road and 7 kilometres from the camp, where they were joined by the rest of 28 and a 2nd 219 battery. The artillery was soon delivering a heavy volume of fire in support of the advancing column, as well as the Playmate camp. Lure and ambush has failed. The lure and ambush tactic had failed. The 320th regiments had been unable to destroy the Orvan relief column, and by October 25th, it was evident that the 33rd regiments had taken more punishment than it could withstand. Two of its three battalion commanders had been killed, the other seriously wounded, the 2nd Battalion had lost 250 men, about half its strength, and the 1st and 3rd Battalions had also sustained considerable losses. The Regimental Motor Company had been decimated, half its men killed, and five of its nine tubes smashed, and almost all of its heavy anti-aircraft machine guns had also been destroyed. Fieldfront ordered Lieutenant Colonel Vu Sa, 33rd Regiment Commander, to withdraw west to its rally point, a place the NVA referred to as the Village of Crow. Crow was likely a way station on the route to field front base areas, located in the Chupong Mountain complex on the Cambodian border. At 10pm on the 25th, Regimental Headquarters ordered the withdrawal, which was to begin the following morning, leaving 3rd Battalion as rear guard. Sting in the tail General Hun ordered Luat to clear the area north of the Playmate camp, then to continue west toward the airstrip, 
which had been the source of the heaviest enemy fire. DHF moved out in two columns, the M41 Tank Company and 22nd Ranger Battalion on the right, the APCs, 142nd Infantry and 21st Rangers on the left. Luat had swept the northern slope by 9.30am on the 26th, which appeared to have been abandoned, and over the next few hours the task force cautiously traversed the camp's northern apex. By 2pm the ATF had passed the bunker on the western point of the camp and began to sweep south. South of the airstrip the ground became broken, making progress difficult for the tracked vehicles, but when the order was given to turn back, the movement quickly became a confused mess with some of the Auburn infantry taking the opportunity to loot parachute drops for supplies. At this moment, at 12.05pm, the reinforced NVA 3rd Battalion, dug in and prepared to cover the regiment's withdrawal, opened fire with mortars, B-40 rockets, machine guns and recoilless rifles. Mortar rounds also exploded across the camp. Under this sudden and intense fire, some of the tank and APC crews panicked and fled, the ambush quickly threatening to turn into a rout. At position homecoming, the two batteries from 219 opened up a heavy barrage, and soon fighter bombs were also strafing the NVA and making napalm runs. With the NVA receiving a pounding, Luat rallied the task force for a limited counter-attack, and after an hour the rear guard was forced to break contact and withdraw. But the ambush had cost the Arvan 27 dead and at least 80 wounded. Epilogue The smell of rotting flesh hung over the playmate camp, the stench rising up to the helicopters flying over the area and sinking into the skin of the men who defended it. The 2nd Battalion, 8th Cavalry, made an airmobile assault into the shattered landscape at 10am on the 27th, quickly moving around the west and east of the camp toward Objective Cherry, a 400 metre hill 2 kilometres south of the Playmate camp. Facing only sporadic sniper fire, the objective was secured with one man killed and one wounded. Staff Sergeant Charles W. Rose was killed by a sniper leading his squad up the hill. Rose and Captain Avera would be the first cavalrymen to receive Valor Awards, both men receiving a Bronze Star with V device. It was clear that the NVA had failed and had fled the battlefield. What was unclear was where the two regiments had gone and what they would do next. General Westmoreland met Larson at Field Force Vietnam headquarters at Nha Chan on October 24th to discuss what the 1st Cavalry Division would do when the siege ended. The division could concentrate on the coastal lowlands and Binzing province, or it could search for the two NVA regiments and engage them. Kinnard wanted to pursue the NVA regiments, and four days later on the 28th, Westmoreland ordered the 1st Cavalry Division to take the initiative in Pleiku province. In the past, the enemy had been allowed to hit and run, but this time he would be pursued and destroyed and the instruments of this new approach would be the airmobile 1st Cavalry Division. The stage was set for a series of electrifying and climactic battles in the coming weeks. <laughs>